Welcome to Message of Faith, the Bible teaching ministry of yours truly, Bill Robertson. In 2 Timothy 2.15 we read, Study to show thyself proved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And in Romans 10 verse 8 we read, The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. Please sit back with Bible and pen in hand and let's get started with today's study, always ensuring to rightly divide the word of truth. It is only then we are able to go forth and teach the message of faith. Pam is going to be reading us an opening scripture. Uh, this really isn't a team teaching event or anything. Uh, she's going to let me do the teaching, but that's for sure. She just wanted to say hello to everyone and, and read a, a Bible verse. Okay, just wanted to encourage you today with First Timothy six twelve. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And then let us all be able to say, 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Well, love you all, you take care, hope you're encouraged today, God bless. In our last Bible study, we addressed various things pertaining to the question, what is the church? One of the areas we discussed was, as church history records, the first century of the church beginning within its foundation on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they were praising God, spreading the gospel in the region of the Mediterranean, was then persecuted while struggling through centuries of darkness. There was always a remnant of true believers, yet there were groups that had managed to protest apostasy, and pulled away from godless tradition. And finally, believers went on to great success with many generations of missionary zeal. We also talked about how that the apostasy prophesied in Scripture is a shadow of the last days. That shadow approaching prior to the rapture of the church, keeping us from the hour of temptation which shall come upon the whole world. And that's written to the Philadelphian church in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Today I want to explore what the Word of God says about what is traditionally called the Great Commission. The last time we met, we also discussed the Church of the Great Missionary Movement with an approximate start date in the early 1600s. Beginning in Europe, and eventually crossing over to the North American continent, one of the questions I asked was, did that end in the year 1900, the year 1950? Or perhaps has it already ended? Has it ended already today? I also made the statement, whatever the date is, the final characteristic of the church before the rapture will be a time of deception and apostasy. There are two parallel passages that we traditionally point to when speaking about the Great Commission. And the first one is found in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. And it goes like this. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. 
And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The second passage is found in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, stating, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. These two passages of Scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit, given to two different writers, yet each with a different perspective. Both were said by our Lord, but emphasized differently by Matthew and Luke. There's an interesting side story recorded by Luke in this Acts passage that's alluded to also in Matthew. In Acts chapter 1 verse 6, it states that they asked, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And in Matthew twenty eight seventeen it says, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. It is very possible that the ones doubting him were the same ones questioning him about the kingdom being restored to Israel. I bring this up only as a possibility, but one of the apostles of our Lord that could have been the doubting questioner was Simon the Zealot. And we read about him in Luke chapter 6 verse 15 and Acts chapter 1 verse 13. What was a zealot? The zealots were anti-Rome rebels. They sought to overthrow the Roman government and reestablish the Davidic kingdom in Israel. They knew from Scripture that the Messiah was to be a son of David, and they expected that just as he, David, had enlarged the Davidic kingdom by going to war, the Messiah would also be a strong, warring leader. They also looked for one like Moses, who delivered them from the Egyptian slavery. The idea that the Messianic king would lead a rebellion was the main expectation of the Messiah in Jesus' time, which is why, when he admitted to being the Christ, he was accused of stirring up a rebellion against Rome. And we read about that in Luke chapter 23, verses 2 through 5. So the Lord's response, given when asked about restoring the kingdom, was answered in the way it was, because of their wrong motives in asking. Their focus was not on Jesus' words or his gospel, but on politics. Again I read Acts chapter 1, 7, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power or authority. Matthew 7, verse 29, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. That is the same word used up in Acts, which the Father hath put in his own power or authority. Now that is the Greek word exousia. Matthew 7.29, one having authority is the same word. 
and also in Luke 4, verse 36. And they were all amazed, and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. That word again, authority here is the same, the word power, or Greek exousia. Now also in Acts 1.8, and when it says, Ye shall receive power or mighty works, that is the word dunamis. It's a little different word. You shall receive power or mighty works. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Matthew chapter 13, verse 54. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Now that again is the word dunamis, or mighty works, or power. Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Again, the word dunamis, powers or mighty works. Mark 5.30 And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about, in the press, and said, Who touched my clothes? That word virtue is again that word dunamis, meaning power or mighty works. God has the authority to give us powers or mighty works in order to spread his word, to share his gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, which began 2,000 years ago on Pentecost, with his Holy Spirit. Another passage for what has been called the Great Commission can also be found in Luke chapter 24, verses 47 and 48. And it states that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. The idea of being witnesses to all nations is nothing new. It it comes from an Old Testament passage from Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 10. It is here where Israel is called a servant of the Lord, and a clear command is given. And that verse states, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. In the epistles, the Great Commission is spoken of when the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 10, verses 13 through 15, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? From Isaiah 52, verse 7, that is the quote. It states, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. What is that gospel of peace spoken of? We often quote 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-4, through 4, stating, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, 
by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. One of the most quoted gospel verses is the well-known passage we all know by heart, John 3:16. Even little children know this by heart. We see this verse referenced often on billboards and signs shown at large events, such as professional football games. As a wonderful scripture as John 3:16 is, I personally have the conviction that John 3, verses 16 through 20, are one of the best gospel passages when put together as a whole. It shows not only the love of God, but the consequences of not believing in his only begotten Son. It goes on to speak of the need for a repentant heart. John 3, 16 through 20. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. The need for a repentant heart is the first message that our Lord Jesus himself taught in Mark chapter 1. 14 through 15, which states, Now after that, John, meaning John the Baptist, was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Sadly today, we hear many false teachers criticize the clear message of the need for repentance. They seriously do not read their Bibles, do they? That same gospel, the same gospel that requires one to repent and believe, has never changed, by the way. In the book of Jude, chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, we read this. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, meaning shameless indecency, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord, Jesus Christ. The term, earnestly contend for, it describes a definite intensity when you see that in the Greek it means agonizing struggle or literally fighting for the faith. In the Old Testament, King Solomon even speaks of this concept. In Proverbs chapter 28, verses 4 and 5, it states, They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend or stir up or strive with them. Evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. Here is more of what the Lord God says about the understanding of the ungodly. Psalm chapter 53, verses 2 through 3, 
God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And that was quoted, by the way, in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. Here is more of what God says about the righteous man and his understanding of God. Psalm chapter 119, verse 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. Proverbs 4, verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. And Proverbs 15, verse 32. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. When we seek to win the lost through gospel tracts, a spoken word to a neighbor or associate, when giving our testimony, when we pray for our lost loved ones or support a ministry that we believe is preaching the gospel, we are in a battle. We stir up contention and strife with the devil and his evil. Evil men understand not the judgment of God, but they that seek the Lord have godly understanding. Here is something to remember as it says in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. For we wrestle or strive not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, meaning the origin of evil, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But we have the mighty work of God in us. 1 John chapter 4, verses 3-4 through 4, That spirit of Antichrist, which whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I am sure we all know how the world is changing and is no longer receptive with its openness to the gospel as it once was. Many years ago, there were many missionaries in China before Imperial Japan took over the late 1930s and before communism in the late 1940s. By 1953, all Protestant missionaries had been expelled by the communist government of China. Yet in spite of that, there is a large underground church in hiding, living under persecution. South Korea had and still has a growing missionary effort, even more so since the Korean War ended in the early 1950s. South Korea has the distinction of being the second highest exporter of missionaries in the world after the United States. If the Lord tarries and the communists in North Korea fall, there will be a vast ripe field wide open to the gospel. Yet I am sure that there is a remnant of believers there now. But if allowed, the gospel could be spread with even more souls won for Christ in that region. We need to follow the Lord's admonition in Matthew chapter 9, verse 38. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I would like to read an excerpt from a book entitled The Good Shepherd Calls, and it's in a section called A Shepherd with Courage. And this is written by a brother named Roger Oakland. In this excerpt, it begins, In the 1960s, Bible-believing Christians in the Soviet Union 
or under terrible attack by the government. Churches that would not come under the communist authorities were shut down. While many pastors succumbed to this governmental pressure to become state-run churches, some did not. Pastor Georgie e. Vins was just one of these in his 30s. His own father, years earlier, had been arrested for resisting the governmental efforts to snuff out the gospel in the Soviet Union and was sent to prison for his faith where he died. George Evans was no stranger to persecution, and with the influence of a godly mother and the legacy of his father, Georgie was determined to remain faithful to God regardless of the price. In 1965, a group of Baptist churches in the Soviet Union formed an alliance, setting forth their declaration that they would continue teaching the Word of God and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They called the alliance the Council of Churches of Evangelical Christians and Baptists. Pastor Vins became its general secretary, still in his 30s. He was later arrested for his involvement in the underground church and was given a three-year sentence, leaving behind a wife and four children. Later, after his release, he was arrested again and given a ten-year sentence. Pastor Vins and many other Christian pastors during this period in the Soviet Union showed great courage and fortitude in the midst of persecution and imprisonment. Today, in the Western world, it is still legal to preach the gospel and teach the word of God. The price to stand for truth is not nearly as dear as it has been for countless of martyrs of the past and for Bible believers in many countries presently. Will shepherds today follow the good shepherd and feed his sheep no matter the cost. And I would like to ask that question a little differently, if I may. Will we, as the called out body of Christ, be willing to openly and shamelessly share the gospel as long as we are able? To earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints in spite of hardship in spite of persecution? I would like to end with these last passages of Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And then also from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And our final verse as we close, reading again from Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. Amen.